easier to dive into in this video. But one of the big things we have already is a new version of Y2JB. So we got the initial release of this YouTube jailbreak. So even though it's called YouTube jailbreak, it's not a full jailbreak yet until it's chained with the lapse kernel exploit, which will then allow us to use it to jailbreak the PS5. But at the moment, it is just the user land only portion of the exploit that has been released. So we got the initial release of version 1.0, but now we're on version 1.1, which has already made a number of changes in just a day. We have a faster version of the exploit, so it runs faster now. It also disables the PSN dialogue after the first sign out pop up. When you run the exploits, this dialogue would keep popping up about signing into PlayStation Network. Uh, every time you click OK, it would eventually come back along with some other error pop ups. That's now been removed, so it only pops up once. So once you click OK, you will no longer have any more pop ups after that, and you'll just have the log from the exploit. We also have a new set log server payload that's been added. So now you can dynamically set and connect to a log server at runtime. And then it's also fixed the screen logging to handle new lines correctly. So we have two versions here, the backup file, which can be restored on non jailbroken consoles in order to get the exploit set up on them. And then for consoles that already have a jailbreak, you can download the download zero zip file and extract that file and then use FTP with an existing jailbreak on your PS5 to go into the user download folder and then the PPSA01650. You can create that folder if it doesn't already exist and copy the file in that location and that will get the exploit installed. And then you just need to install the YouTube application from a USB drive with the debug settings package installer. I've already done a full setup guide showing how to set this up with the backup and restore method and installing it manually on a jailbroken PS5. So I'll leave that video linked down in the description. You also need to edit your network settings and change the primary DNS server from automatic to manual and set a DNS of 127.0.0.2 and that will disable the DNS so that you do not get any updates for the application and it will prevent anything from getting overwritten with the exploit. Now you can also try a Nomadix DNS server, which is 62.210.38.117, and that will block updates, preventing the YouTube application from being updated. However, sometimes I've noticed that with Nomadix DNS, if you go to run it, you might still get a message when you load the YouTube application saying that it is trying to download an update. If that happens, I would switch back to the 127.0.0.2 and use that as your DNS instead, because that issue can sometimes happen. But if you don't run into any issues using Nomadic's DNS server, then use that one because then you can be still connected to the internet properly while still having the updates blocked. So that's how you get things set up there. So when you run the YouTube application, it will then run the latest version of the exploit there. And you can click OK to the PSN message and you'll have the exploit running. So we also have the log server payload that was added in this new release to redirect the log for the exploit to your computer. You can do that by just downloading the source code as a zip file and extracting the payloads folder from it to your desktop. Then if we open that up and open up the setlogserver.js file in a text editor, you can change the IP address that's in there to your computer's IP address. So just enter your computer's IP address in there and save the file, then simply load that payload into your payload injectors. Now there is this new Y2JB remote JS loader from Master S or Master S9, which is just a graphical user interface for sending the payloads. So you can use that instead of the command line version, or you can use a normal payload injector like Netcat GUI. So for Netcat GUI, we enter the PS5's IP address in the host box and the port number as 50,000 and drag and drop the setlogserver.js file inside. Before we send the payload, we need to run the listener on the computer, which can also be found in the zip file for the source code. So in there, there is a log.py file that you can extract to your desktop and then simply right click and open in terminal in the same location as that file and type in Python space log.py and press enter. And that will start listening on port 8080. If you have Python installed, you can then send the payload with your payload injector. Now, if it fails to establish a connection, it could be because your computer's firewall is blocking it. That was the problem in my situation. So I had to go to the public networks for Windows Defender and disable the firewall temporarily. And then I was able to establish a connection by injecting the payload again. And as you can see there, we now get the log redirected to our computer. 
So if I want to send any other payloads like the Hello World payload, which will just print out the Hello from Remote JS to the log, I can drag and drop that payload in and then send that one with Netcat GUI. And you can see it shows up there on the computer. So the full log from the exploit has now been redirected to our computer for debugging and testing. And you can see it's the same log that is displayed on the console itself. So that's what we've got with the latest version of Y2 Jailbreak. And we're basically just waiting for it to get paired with the kernel exploit as the lapsed kernel exploit will need to be ported to be loaded from this exploit in a JavaScript file, presumably. So that may take a while, but once that's done, we'll be able to chain this with the lapsed kernel exploit to jailbreak our PS5s. So another thing worth mentioning here is that there has been a new system software update released for the PS5. This is now bringing it to version 12.20 after the previous version was 12.02 which coincided with the release of 13.02 on the PS4 as well. So that was a simultaneous update on both systems, fixing some security bugs. In this case, we don't see any messages about any security fixes in this particular version. But as we know, just because it doesn't specifically mention security fixes does not mean necessarily that there aren't any included in here. So there could still be a security fix. However, if there are any security fixes in this version, it is of course PS5 only because the PS4 did not release a update at the same time. So this was a PS5 only update, bringing us up to 12.20. At least that gets us away from the confusion of having 12.02 being the latest firmware on the PS5, while also being 12.02 being the latest jailbreakable firmware on the PS4, which could certainly cause some confusion. So kind of glad that they've actually updated to a different version now on the PS5. So moving on, Lightning Mods has been sharing some more developments here with the game overlay menu, which is coming to the next build of ETA Hen. So of course, the initial test build did give us the initial overlay menu, allowing us to display the GPU, CPU, and uh, all CPU core statistics, as well as the RAM usage on screen whenever you run your applications in the top left-hand corner. It displays that information. However, what's been added here in the next version is we're going to be getting the ability to change the overlay position so that you can move it to the top right, to the bottom right and bottom left, as well as the top left as well, which is default. So you'll find that in the game overlay menu and you'll be able to switch it to different parts of the screen. There's also an FPS section being added, so you'll get your FPS counter displayed, which we can see displayed here in the top left hand corner. 60 FPS there in the menu on Black Ops 3, shared by Lightning Mods. And then also another thing that's coming is going to be an IP address section. So you can also toggle that in the menu and have your PS5's IP displayed on any application in that same menu. So this is very handy for mod tools or trainers. If you're wanting to connect any of those things to your console, then you don't have to back out and go into your system information to get your IP address. If you have a dynamically allocated IP that changes all the time, that is kind of annoying, but having it just displayed on screen there on any of your applications makes it nice and easy so you can get quickly connected with your mod tools and your trainers. So very useful also for FTP and anything else that requires you to connect remotely to your console via its IP address. So that's another handy feature that's going to be added in the next release of ETA Hen. And then also there have been some new PS5 game releases that have come out recently. So we have the GTA Definitive Edition with the full trilogy now available. So all three games are now available there and that supports firmwares going all the way back to 3.xx. And then we also have Crash Bandicoot 4, It's About Time. So this PS5 game dump is available all the way back to 2.x firmwares. And then we also have some VR games that are now added. So PSVR 2 game backups are playable on the PS5 if you do have a PSVR 2 headset. So we have Star Wars Tales from Galaxy's Edge Enhanced Edition. And that one works all the way back to 5.x firmwares and also has a 4.xx backport. So you can run it on 4.xx firmwares. And then we also have the Walking Dead Saints and Sinners Retribution. And this one works back to 6.xx firmwares at the moment, it seems. So that's what's currently available there. Now, another thing that's uh, been noticed recently is that you can fix a lot of PS5 games that do not run from the internal storage by just changing the file permissions. Now this doesn't fix every game. So, you know, there are still a lot of games that have to be loaded from a USB drive as a PS5 game dump. Otherwise they just do not run when installed to the internal storage. But there were some games that people were having issues with 
when they were installed to the internal storage where they would just get a black screen on launch where they were actually able to fix them by simply changing the permissions. And you can do that by, you know, after copying the game into whatever location is on the internal storage or an internal NVMe drive, then you just basically use FTP to connect remotely to your console, find the location of that game dump, right click on the folder, go to properties, and then just make sure you set the permissions to 777, which is read, write and execute. So you want to set those permissions via FileZilla with FTP and then simply tell it to apply that to all subdirectories. So it applies it to all files and all subdirectories and then click OK and that will go through and set those permissions on every file for that game and then try and launch the game from the internal storage and see if you still get a black screen or not. If you do still get a black screen, it just might be one of those games that that cannot be loaded from the internal storage. But for many games that people were having problems with, it, that can actually resolve it and get it running from the internal storage, which is quite interesting. But I still certainly noticed a few games that despite this fix would still just black screen whenever I tried to launch it. So it does not appear to be a 100% fix that solves it for every game that's out there. But uh, yeah, still something useful if you are trying to run your games from the internal storage or from an internal M.2 drive. So anyway, that's going to do it for this update. Hope you guys enjoyed this one or found the information useful. If you did, please leave a like and subscribe. And once again, as always, I'll hopefully see you guys 